Welcome everybody to Fivey Church, where I'm recording this week's service. Rachel and Rosemary will provide music and the light is filtered through our lovely window showing St Michael the Angel, the work of Louis Comfort Tiffany, for those of you who don't know it. Both of our church buildings feel so odd without all of you in them. So I am looking forward to the day when we can be together again. Until then, let's share our virtual worship space in gratitude to God for the work of the technologists who built it and within the shelter of this space, build the house of God shared amongst us. We begin with a part of Psalm 119 as translated by Eugene Peterson in the message. By your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've committed myself and I'll never turn back from living by your righteous order. Everything's falling apart on me, God. Put me together again with your word. Festoon me with your finest sayings, God. Teach me your holy rules. My life is as close as my own hands, but I don't forget what you have revealed. The wicked do their best to throw me off track, but I don't swerve an inch from your course. I inherited your book on living. It is mine forever. What a gift and how happy it makes me. I concentrate on doing exactly what you say. I always have. I always will. Let us pray. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. God of Abraham, and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, God of all of us. You have given us the law and the prophets, the histories and the her stories of faith and lit the fire within us that is the sign of your presence. We worship you by the light that you send even in dark times. We bring all that our lives contain here with us into your presence, the good, the bad and the ugly of human relationships, the light of our dreams and the darkness of our despair. And we bring our neighbours too, and all whom we worry for. Here we are known in all our fra frailty and God-given strength. May we open our hearts and minds to know you too, almighty mystery, flame that burns away certainty and cynicism both, and sends us light for our feet to follow. Accept our praise and the work of our hands and hearts, as we lay it all at your feet for this moment together, no matter how isolated we are from one another physically. Yours is the flame and the ember, the lamp and the candle, the moon and the stars and the sun. Yours is the earth on which we stand and all that it contains. Yours is every faithful heart turned to follow the lamp that lights the soul. To you be glory now and forever. In the name of Christ our Lord, who calls each one of us to you. Amen. Our readings this morning pick up on the story of Isaac and his wife Rebecca as they play their part in the foundation of God's people. Then they lead us to a very well known story that Jesus told. So let us listen for the word of God. In Genesis chapter 25, at verse 19. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac played to the Lord, prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. 
Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. And from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13, we read from verse 1 to 9 and then verses 18 to 23. At about that same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. Using the boat as a pulpit, he addressed his congregation telling stories. What do you make of this? A farmer planted some seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and the birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel. It sprouted quickly but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds and as it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Study this story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it remains on the surface. So the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel. This is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there is no soil of character. And so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, but weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard and nothing comes of it. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. To his name be praise and glory. And now we're going to sing together hymn 153, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
one of the best bits of advice I've ever heard is don't shop on an empty stomach. If I do, all sorts of things end up in the basket that I would never have added had I not been craving the easiest and most available meal. It is amazing how irresistible the things that are not good for us become when our bodies are running out of energy. Only a huge effort of will can stop the crisp bag or the bar of chocolate or the sausage roll being opened and consumed before you even get as far as the checkout. If you persist in going hungry, you will enter a new state of being that my American friends have a fantastic word for. They call it hangry, when extreme grumpiness takes over until you finally eat. I'm hoping you all recognise this and it's not just me. And how I wish I craved apples instead of chocolate, muesli instead of cheese, crackers instead of a doorstop of fresh sourdough slathered in butter. In a state of hangriness, bad decisions can be made about food. And worse, a person who has already eaten, seeing your weakness in hangriness, can exploit it. And this is what happened to Rebecca and Isaac's older twin son Esau when he came in for a hunting trip. Jacob had been cooking and he could smell lentil stew and fresh bread. If you've ever had lentil stew in the Middle East, you'll know this is not some vegetarian torture device, but a delicious and spicy dish full of lentils and vegetables, and especially with bread fresh from the outdoor oven. It is irresistible. Jacob and Esau were the same age. But it seems that Esau made it out of the womb first, with his brother hanging on to his heel as if trying to stop the escape. Poor Rebecca. She waited 20 years for her babies, and they arrived already fighting with one another. Of course, this story is overlain with the mythology of nation founding. Esau is shown to be the ancestor of the land of Edom, and Jacob of the land of ancient Israel, and the struggle between them reflects the struggle for dominance in the Middle East, both then and sadly also now. A struggle symbolised by Esau the hunter going out to find game, and Jacob cooking the products of agriculture in a settled camp. The conflict between farmers and gatherer hunters would only get worse as settlements grew and the land was planted. But to return to our story, Esau, famished from his trip into the forest hunting, wanted that lentil stew and bread more than anything else in that moment. He wanted it so much he did not notice or care about his brother extracting from him his rights as the firstborn son. In our time, these things are decreasing in importance as our societies begin to think more about equality and fairness. But in ancient times, this was the way of things. The eldest son inherited everything. Everything that his father had had and was then responsible for dealing with younger siblings as they saw fit. And all parents would have hoped that they would have dealt fairly with the other children. But we all know the horror stories, even from our times, of disputes over inheritance in families. For a bowl of stew and some fresh bread, Esau gave away his rights and Jacob took them. It was slyly done. It may even have been planned. Either Esau didn't care or he didn't take the moment seriously, thinking it the usual teasing between brothers. For Jacob had the brains and Esau the brawn in this relationship. Same parents, entirely different children. We see this in our own families too. But do we see that other dangerous thing, the division of the parents over which child they prefer? 
Most parents love their children as equally as they can. And rightly so, because making differences between the treatment is the root of strife, of injustice and of entitlement, of the things which lie behind so many ills in our society. So now we see that this story is about so much more than the Middle East. It is about all of us and about the struggle to be in power over one another. Our hunger for power is even greater than Esau's desire for lentil stew, and it can lead us into be evil behaviour with awful results. The only thing that mitigates our human need for dominance is listening to the words of God's law and abiding by them. For if we hear and understand the laws of God and keep them in our souls, we cannot behave as Jacob did. We will find ways to make things fair by staying within the justice of God's law, by acting openly and fairly, by apologising, by admitting when we have been wrong, by making good the faults, by forgiving insult and injury in order to restore the right relationships. Esau and Jacob would have to learn this. It is allowing the law of God to be a light on our way. And we do this by taking in God's law and letting it grow in us. Many years later, sitting in a boat on the water, Jesus addressed the people gathered on the beach before him and told them a story. And it begins, what do you make of this? A farmer planted some seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and birds ate it. Some of it fell in the gravel. It sprouted quickly but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by those weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Jesus asked. Later, in explanation to the disciples, Jesus laid out the problem with people and the word of God. The sower broadcasts the seed everywhere and cannot determine the ground into which it might fall. It might fall onto a path where the happy birds will carry it away before it can root. Or it might fall into gravelly soil with no depth for good roots and the plants will fail. It might fall in among the weeds who take up all the goodness and leave no room for the new plant. Or just maybe, there might be good soil. It is a lottery in the hands of the sower, but not in the hands of the creator of the seed. The seed will find enough good soil to bear a harvest for the creator, even with all the distractions of the world taking up so much of people's attention. So it is that God is able to reach our hearts wherever we are. The state of the soil can always be improved. Gravel can be removed, weeds taken out. It is the one who owns that soil up to them to make it fertile for the seeds of God's word to grow. Jacob and Esau's relationship would change over time as well as grow and mature in understanding of their own behaviour and the behaviours of others, and so will ours if we are wise. Wisdom is the defining factor in the size of the harvest. If, like the writer of the psalm, we are open to hearing the word of God and putting it into practice, things will change in us. The state of the soil improves, the plants grow stronger and leave less room for weeds to take hold. It is the process of living and growing which we see all around us, the process that Jesus observed all around him and used to teach us all. In order to hear this teaching, we have to unblock our ears. In order to see, we have to look. Paying attention is the key to understanding. If Esau had been paying attention, he would not have been tricked. If Jacob had been paying attention to his behaviour, 
he would not have thought of tricking Esau. If Rebekah and Isaac had been paying attention, they would not have favoured one child over another. If we are paying attention, we will not lose our way or choke out the plants of God growing in our hearts. The law of the Lord, as interpreted by our Lord Jesus Christ, is the law of love for God, love for self and love for neighbour, intertwined in a trinity of blessing. Growing together in our souls, nurtured by the attention, the lamp for our feet through all our dark world burns bright enough to show us the way we are looking for. None of us can see far ahead at the moment. And the world seems full of dangerous possibilities, not least in the Middle East at the moment. There are many things that vie for our attention in the problems around us. But if we root our attention here, in obedience to the law of God, in worship, in study, in prayer, in all the things that give attention to God, then our experience will be different. We will behave well to one another and in this world. If we wait, if we remember to wait until our fellow human beings' needs for food and shelter have been fulfilled before asking them to make decisions, then we all make good decisions together from an equal place. We will trust in the wisdom of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ and walk his way of attention to all that's going on around and within us. We will not let the weeds, the birds or the gravelly soil deprive God of the harvest in our lives. Each of us, equally loved children of our God upon the good earth. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now we're going to sing together hymn number 229, We Plough the Fields and Scatter the Good Seed on the Land.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you looked around you and used what you saw and knew in your heart to teach us about life and love, about the laws of God lived out loud. Help us as we try to walk that path through life. May we be sowers of the seed of faith and of love in the hearts around us. We pray that every human soul might have the chance to choose well. May they have what they need to eat. May they have shelter and safety before they are asked to make decisions that will affect their future. We pray for all our young people trying to make decisions in the wake of mystic Psalms. We pray for teachers trying to decide how schools will go back. We pray for key workers holding the line and for those who work in the NHS and emergency services trying to find the new normal. May there be lamps for their feet. We pray for decision makers in our parliaments in Holyrood and Westminster that they may keep their attention focused on what is important. We pray that poverty, inequality and injustice may not be hidden in the weeds but be obvious until they are dealt with forever. We pray for those who are ill, asking that they may have access to the treatment they need, made possible by attention paid to those who understand their needs. We pray for those who are trapped in the economic chaos and have no way to make decisions at the moment, deprived of agency in their own future. May they have the light for their feet that reminds them to live in faith. We take a moment to pray now for those whom we know who need your help. Lord Jesus, who notices everything, we give to you our trust and faith that you will answer these prayers. And we give you our thanks for all the prayers you have already answered in the love of God as we say together the words that you taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the peace of this space, the peace of Christ our Lord, go with you back into your lives. May the wisdom of the Holy Spirit light your way. May the love of God uphold you and those whom you love, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.